This is Robert Stark. I am uh, joined here with uh, Paul Bingham. We're going to be discussing uh, Alistair Crowley. Uh, Paul, it's great having you on the show. It's great to be back, Robert. And I'm also uh, joined here with uh, Alex von Goldstein. It's great to be on with you guys, and Paul, haven't spoken to you yet, so I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Likewise, Alex. It's a privilege to be on the show. As far as Alistair uh, Crowley goes, there's a lot of uh, kind of perceptions about him, and I, this image of him, especially kind of that on the whole conspiracy theory uh, angle of like the populist right, a lot of people on the populist right kind of dismiss him as either uh, as like either just a degenerate libertine. Uh, some people call him a Satanist. Uh, some people say that he he's part of like the New World Order and the Illuminati. And then on the other hand, I think the '60s counterculture they kind of uh, latched on to like his imagery. But people haven't really uh, analyzed his uh, ideas in depth that much. I've been looking for some writings. I have found there were uh, Kerry Bolton over at Countercurrents in an excellent series on his ideas. I know uh, Keith Preston, in our latest interview with him in his book, Thinkers Against Modernity, had a chapter on Crowley. Then also there's this site, it's kind of a troll site, uh, Alistair Crowley uh, 2012, like a kind of a joke president uh, can, troll campaign, but it does have like this listed uh, sort of pol like a political platform of his ideas. There's also some James J. O'Meara on Crowley that's kind of interesting and isn't there that guy, Richard B. Spence, who's not the other Richard B. Spencer, but he's just Spence, and he wrote the spy novels about Crowley? Is that... I haven't read those, but I'm familiar with them. Paul, I read it quite a while ago. I can't even remember the gist of what I read, but I do remember reading something by Spence on Crowley. In any case... Uh, the interesting thing about Crowley from beginning to end is that Crowley was fascinated by power structures in the world of his time and the future power structures, and he was also very into personal freedom and even pushing the limits of personal freedom. But at the same time, he recognized that not everyone was into uh, freedom and the pursuit of freedom, the pursuit of liberty, and pushing the boundaries as much as he was, just as not everybody was into mountain climbing the way he he was, and achieving those goals was a limited franchise. So in other words, he, he devolves from the left in that uh, he does not believe that, uh, he's not an egalitarian at all, but he devolves from the right and from the free market in that he is not, he is both amoral or certainly not a conventional moralist, and he is not a, any, a free market liberal. So he falls very much into his own category, but in many ways he transcends a lot of the contemporary political uh, nuances because, again, he was into power and he recognizes that the forms of power are not necessarily power itself. The party politics of today that we get sucked into are not actual power. They're just forms of power, just as the monarchy in England is not the actual power in England. So the political parties in the United States and other Democrat, Western Democratic countries are not the actual ruling authorities. And Crowley recognizes this, so he kind of moves beyond contemporary politics into a realm uh, that not many people want to deal with, and that's why so many different types of people can claim them. The 60s hippies, countercultural movement, uh, there's figures like Evola and the traditionalist right that that's have found him fascinating. Have you read Evola's uh, uh, writings on Crowley? Evola's writings on Crowley are very, um, are very carefully done because Evola basically views him as a very interesting interesting individual of, uh, and he kind of treats him very tentatively as a subject because uh, I don't believe Evola was as advanced a Freemason as Crowley and so he understands there's a lot you don't understand about Crowley in the first place because unless you're a Freemason and pretty high up you don't have a clue what he's talking about a lot of times because 
a lot of the things that he goes into are, unless you have a background in Freemasonry and understand double and triple meanings, then you're not going to quite uh, comprehend what he's going into. So Evelyn's work on him is very tentative, and I hope we can talk about that a little more as we get into the subject. But here's an example of just one of the different schools of thought that have analyzed Crowley or without embracing him. Though some individuals kind of openly embrace him, but that's taking him at face value. To embrace Crowley at any level is to take him at face value, and to take him at face value is to misunderstand his higher points and his, you know, his the subtextual points. I think Crowley was speaking to future audiences rather than the people in his time. Because at his time there was not really a mass movement that evolved uh, around his ideas the same way there was around uh, a lot of uh, Marx, like Marxism or these different uh, right-wing and uh, traditionalist or even fascist movements. And he kind of... He, he has his ideology and thinking is uh, so unique, as you said. He kind of exists out of the like a liberal uh, traditionalist axis. He rejected like modern liberalism, but at the same time, he wasn't a traditionalist either. Uh, Keith Preston, uh, in his uh, book, described him as an aristocratic individualism, and aristocratic individualism. I mean, I subscribe to that philosophy as well, and to to or at least to to a significant well, degree. I, I would say I would say that I do as well, and I I would imagine Paul might too. I think it's something that creative people, if you're like an artist, I think in a lot of ways you are an aristocratic individualist. Would you say you um, are one, Paul? Yeah, to some to some extent or another. Um, to you know, this goes for Crowley. This is the basis of Crowley's whole thought. The end of all of my political thought is my, the advancement of my greater freedom and greater good. And that's what begins and ends for Crowley. It, it all begins with him, his own benefit, his own individualism. In, in many ways, um, you could make the connection between uh, uh, Crowley and Max Stirner. There's a lot of um, Max Stirner in Crowley's philosophy. Total individualism, but tempered by an understanding that you also have to make provisions for others to enhance your own freedom. Yeah, I would say philosophically, I lean towards aristocratic individualism. At the same time, I'm also a pragmatic in the sense I'm not a libertarian or anarchist. Like, there is a rule for the state in things like uh, investing in infrastructure, protecting the environment, uh, a national sovereignty, uh, some degree of a social safety net. So I think the philosophy of individualism is different than, say, the political system of libertarianism or uh, anarchism and just abolishing the state. Robert, uh, before we go on, I would quote a source that you and Alex may be familiar with, and that's Gornaher, G-O-R-N-A-H-O-O-R.net. And uh, it contains a number of writings on uh, Crowley, including Evola's uh, essays on Crowley. And it contains a number of writings on traditionalism and the Magus and um, things related to Crowley. So I would recommend... Uh, those who might be interested, check out net if it's still online. It used to be. I think their archives are still available if it's not there anymore. Yeah, we'll put a link to it at the bottom of our show here. And Crowley, basically, what I was saying about uh, Crowley was, even though he had this kind of a individualistic uh, philosophy, his brand of individualism wasn't uh, about just letting everyone, everyone was the same and kind of do what they want in your kind of stereotypical, like, anarchist uh, sense. It almost kind of reminds me what Rabbit said in our show, like, a genuine freedom is not being able to do whatever you want, but kind of living in the society that you want, your ideal society. And Crowley did have a lot of different uh, 
views, he was critical of uh, capitalism and commercialism because for, he saw capitalism as creating sort of the rule of the merchant class as opposed to a sort of genuine elite of like the best uh, creative types. Well, uh, again, one of the Crowley's backgrounds is that he's very spiritually minded. And a lot of the current alternative rights point, and this is not a side point, but is that uh, some people are genetically inferior and uh, probably good for only slaves if we get right down to the gist of the alternative rights point. But uh, leaving aside the scientific basis, Crowley was a spiritualist. And so Crowley would say, some people are spiritually inferior, and uh, that's looking from a artistic level, from the aristocratic level. They're spiritually inferior. They don't have the creativity. They don't have the creative spirit or what have you, and therefore they are in that same level as those people that the alternative right would c consider genetically inferior. So Crowley is very much focusing on this uh, group of uh, artistic um, artistic uh, individuals that he feels should rule society. Um, you'll find a expostulation on the subject in uh, Wyndham Lewis's book, the, the Art of Being Ruled, in which basically he believes that the artist should rule, not the politician, not the soldier, but the artist should is the person that best is spiritually and uh, politically the best individual to rule overall, and regardless of kind of what kind of government you have. Uh, Crowley supported a social safety net, but not from a sort of a Marxist standpoint, I mean, or egalitarian standpoint. Uh, he uh, rejected a Marxism as kind of a collectivist a group identity, but his reasoning, reasoning for a, a social safety net was that it would free up like the creative types to pursue these uh, greater things than just being kind of like a wage slaves. And you see that today as a lot of people are very creative as writers, uh, artists, intellectuals, uh, political thinkers, but they're not able to pursue their dreams because they have to uh, work and he did also put like a strong value on a sort of a cult, on a sort of culture of a leisure, which a lot of traditionalists would reject as kind of decadent. Like there's a whole concept of like the Protestant uh, work ethic, and Crowley would probably would have rejected that. Well, as I've I've observed to you before, Robert, um, most of modern traditionalism or rightist traditionalism is a form of LARPing, a live action role play. And uh, the thing about Crowley that's interesting is in all of his uh, engagements, he, he focuses on ritual and actually engaging in a lot of, practicing a lot of what he preaches, putting it to the test. So again, the right rejects leisure because Supposedly, you're supposed to be always working, but that's not a traditionalist principle. Um, it, the aristocracy was supposed to have considerable leisure to practice its arts, to engage in warfare or whatever it pleased. And you had the laboring class that engaged in labor because that's what they were uh, designed for and basically bred for. So again, um, when the traditionalists write attempts a critique of Crowley, it, they always come up with um, short because of their own hypocrisy, because their fundamental structure is based on a form of uh, essential, essentially cosplay, as they call it, or it's just as ridiculous as uh, those individuals who uh, basically, uh, you know, the My Little Pony type people, when they want to embrace traditionalism, it's just as as uh, as fraudulent as uh, those in, well, there's people actually a lot of and, there's a lot of correlation conventions. There's a lot of correlation between uh, traditionalist people that read Joyce Evola and people that are into My Little Pony that are bronies. I mean, I've I've, yeah, I've, I've seen brony. Uh, someone named like Buttercup Dew was writing on Countercurrents. 
you know, it's just a, it's yeah, a and, the, and that's like I said, that's going to happen because there it's a, it's a, it appeals to people who like the live action role play. It's not real with Crowley. You love him or hate him, he tries to push the boundaries of the spirit, whether it's by right, by uh, ritual, by living the lifestyle he lived, by drugs, by mountaineering, whatever he did, he pushed the limits of his understanding, which modern traditionalists don't do. They never push their limits. They use traditionalism to justify their current lifestyle, whatever it may be, but they never attempt to push its limits. Kind of is what the philosophy of futurism is about. It's about testing what works and what does not work, as opposed to doing the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, it it, it, it involves uh, trying out things that may be new, but they're not. You know, they they embody the same principle. It may be a new invention, supposedly, but it involves the same principle. For example, the futurists embracing the automobile. The automobile just means speed. Speed means testing yourself and your prowess. Uh, it's no different than a chariot race. There's a there's an old picture of an Italian motorway in which uh, several motorcycles are pulling a chariot, and they're engaged in a race in Italy. And that's kind of what the futurists kind of had. You know, they take the ancient art, art of chariot racing, and they have these motorcycles hitched to a chariot. So it's the same principle of testing yourself, your own prowess, um, with a new means. It's just a new means of testing yourself, you know? And he had this uh, new religion uh, called, a Thil- I think it's uh, Thelema, and it's something, it was definitely, I mean, I'm not really that big of an expert on uh, Thelema, but it was definitely inspired by a lot of uh, pre-Christian uh, pagan religions like ancient Egypt. He was brought up in a very kind of a strict uh, Quaker uh, background, so he did resent uh, that he resented sort of his religious upbringing, and he created like a new. Or I don't know if he created that religion. He did join up a group called the Golden Dawn, and then he rose up in the ranks of that. And also, he had this concept of creating a new Thelemic state, and he even wrote like a manifesto. He also talks about kind of the role of the individual in this uh, Thelemic state and what their social duty should be. But he was also a major critic of democracy as well. I remember when I interviewed a rabbit about Robert Heinlein, Robert Heinlein's view was that people needed to prove they were invested in a society in order to partake in democracy. And uh, uh, Crowley's views were very similar to that. And that's the other thing about democracy in the, in the beginning, in that democracy works in a society like ancient Athens, where everybody, all the participants are basically distant cousins to one another. And you have your... Um, so they're all of the same basic bloodstocks or from a common ancestry, and they all have the good of their own uh, family at, uh, at heart. Their their interests all coincide. So uh, there's the there's the uh, the pull of the blood, as it were, towards uh, making decisions mutually beneficial to a community. And, uh, again, uh, Crowley, very much connected with that in that he was very proud of his Scottish ancestry, or at least his Scottish roots. If not, I don't believe he was actually Scottish, but he... Maybe, great, maybe you think Irish, interest. because I know he was shunned by the English for supporting Irish independence. No, uh, he, he had some links to Scotland as well, and often dressed... Uh, often dressed in Scottish uh, regalia because of his interest in the clans and so forth. Uh, because there you had the link to genuine democracy. The, uh, the rule of the clans was as near to democracy, as any in democracy as, you know, as anything. If you look 
look at a lot of his economic views, there's definitely are a lot of similarities to a lot of these ideas like a distributism and social credit. But what is kind of ironic about that is uh, just both distributism and social credit came out of kind of like traditionalist uh, Catholic uh, social thought. But well, they, even though I, they came from different angles, they came to the same conclusions well, about economics. I mean, I do think that um, these alternatives to capitalism that, that aren't Marxism, things like guild socialism or social credit, I think that these are the economic systems of aristocratic individuals. You know, like Ezra Pound was a, was a, was a uh, you know, very prominent writer on social credit. Well, we can go even before Ezra Pound back to Pruden, who Marx hated in his lifetime. Pruden was a socialist, but he was not an egalitarian socialist, and he was he was not even a uh, he was very much in favor of dividing the French Republic into federal states, for example, and he was in in favor of. Uh, of uh, limited government, so uh, a limited government form of socialism. Is that is that mutualism? No, uh, I don't believe uh, he called it that. He was actively a socialist, but his economic theories were um, embraced by the uh, uh, Charles Morris and the uh, Action uh, France Front in the early 1900s. So they were actually the first right-wing socialist movement uh, to emerge um, in the 20th century. And you see this uh, trend with uh, capitalism is it rewards the people who, well, Marxist critique capitalism from an egalitarian basis, but the real uh, flaw with capitalism, and it rewards people who appeal to kind of the base masses, like think like stuff like Walmart and trashy reality TV like the Kardashians and all that stuff. And I know also Ezra Pound, he mentioned, he also advocated like a like a free income and housing for an artist. Because a lot of the greatest artists and writers throughout history to the present have been broke. Well, the people who become the wealthiest uh, produce the most junk. Yeah, and of course, again, we go back to the spiritual inferiority and superiority, because if you go and you have the rule of the wealthy, the rule of capital, the wealthy will subsidize some real garbage in terms of art, architecture, culture, and social values, as we see in this day and age. The, the wealthy have no taste or capability of artistic dis discrimination, so they will embrace the lowest of the low. Uh, in terms of art and tra trash and, and what, what have you, uh, they, they don't have that uh, appreciation for the finer things. And uh, so that's why you have to have a forcible, uh, uh, you have to have artists cap capable of imposing their will on the masses. And they have to have that ability to impose their will or their culture, because we go back to the, uh, Italy in the time of the Renaissance was a bunch of warlords subsidizing artists, and that's where you get Michelangelo, who was, uh, subsidized by a warlord pope, uh, and to do all this amazing work, both innovative scientific inventions and artistic, uh, work. That was all subsidized by, uh, and forcibly in implemented by warlords. It was not. It was not done in the spirit of peace, and, uh, and uh, it was done in the spirit of violence, or it was made possible by violence. So Crowley was saying that uh, the artist is. Uh, you can't. You, you, the artist cannot simply exist in a society. Um, you have to make provisions for that artist and for the support of artists. Otherwise, if you want uh, to produce any works of art at all, it's going to have to be by forcible measures. One other thing about uh, Crowley is uh, his spirituality did put a sort of emphasis on a connection uh, to uh, nature. And he was into a mountaineering, and that is something very uh, spiritual about 
climbing up to the mountains or just being in that kind of setting. He supported environmentalism, but he still believed in a sort of hierarchy, like he saw humans as being a, a higher on the hierarchy than animals. But at the same time, he did endorse some form of environmentalism where people who abused uh, natural resources and wasted them uh, should be punished. Yeah, there's uh, Crowley, again, uh, you could create a link between him and Edward Abbey. Edward Abbey is not a tree hugger, but nor does he believe that the masked man should be allowed to destroy the vistas that inspire art because uh, the masked man has no interest in those vistas. He has no interest in beautiful forests or mountain ranges or sunsets. He's only interested, he would rather sit in front of his TV and watch porn. So if you allow the masked man to deprive the artist of those vistas that inspire his creativity, then that's going to inhibit the artist. And again, that's only possible. So you have to strike that balance. Yes, it is necessary to cut down trees, as Crowley says. They're not as important as human beings, but it's not necessarily necessarily right to allow the masked man to deforest an area just for the ben- for his own benefit, because what's that going to produce? It's going to produce mass erosion, and it's going to pr- produce mass erosion of the spirit. It's not going to benefit the mass man in the long run either. So that's the whole advantage of having a detached, aristocratic, artistic view of things, of allowing the uh, all the trees to be lost that the the forests that inspired Thoreau, the Rocky Mountains, those mountains that they strip mine for coal to be cut down, it's in the end it benefits no one, and it deprives the artists. So we're simply not going to tolerate the masked man doing all these things for his short term benefit. Do you see? Um, you know, are you familiar with this idea of the economic man or or Homo economicus? You know, it's like this. Yes, like, from, it's like, from uh, Thomas Love Sunik's works. Thomas Love Sunik has written about it, as has Allende Benoit in um, Beyond Human Rights. He, he talks about the transition from the Homo sapien to the Homo economicus. And uh, I, I think Arnold uh, Toynbee also um, refers to this idea. Now, um, do, do you see, um, you know, going off from the last, you know, your last point, where do you see Crowley fitting in w- with this idea of, you know, the homo economicus, the, the, the economic interchangeable man, or, and then like the kind of, um, I guess you could say the beast within the, of with the homo sapien of the kind of animal spirit of, of man. Like where does Crowley, where do his ideas fit in there? I think Crowley, first of all, as a thinker, sees the world in flux. As uh, and he sees the homo economic homo economicus that that type of individual as the type of individual who is in the process of being uh, used. In other words, he's an actor at this time, used for a greater purpose by the corporations. In other words, in the past, the type of humans mass humans were needed for armies, and today we don't need mass armies, so we don't use them for mass armies. We need them as mass consumers. So no longer is there a need for a levy in mass, as they called it in the old in Napoleon days, but we do need the, the maximum amount of consumers. At, but at some point in the future, we're no longer, uh, the elites of the powers that be are no longer going to need those consumers, they may need the mass man for something else, but it won't be for consumption. But right now, the mass man exists to consume. That's what he's created for. That's what he does. And that's what he's meant to do by the powers that be. So he's in flux, in other words. We, he's being used for one purpose. He has been used for other purposes. And in the future, he may be used for another purpose. And so Crowley sees the potential in the mass man, I think, or homo economicus, 
to be used for something else at some point. Maybe it's to build pyramids or build sculpt works of art for, or, you know, labor for on the behalf of the artist. But uh, I think he recognizes that Homo economicus is an individual or a mass type in flux. But if you look throughout history, uh, great monuments were always built for a reason. Uh, in ancient times, uh, they were built uh, for religious regions, from like the from the ancient pyramids of Egypt uh, to the cath uh, cathedrals of like the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And then today, a lot of uh, building projects are motivated by uh, capitalism. Even a lot of great architecture of the 20th century has been produced by a capitalism. But the problem with a society is that if building like monuments and creating aesthetics purely for a profit, there's never this case of building stuff just just purely for to create these like great monuments. And that kind of ties into where having a like a hierarchical based society where you have a creative uh, cast at the top. Yeah, there's always. Uh, a purpose for the masked man, but his purpose is constantly altering. And where Crowley differs from most traditionalists is that he actually feels that, um, or supposedly differs, is that um, the future is brighter than most um, of the traditionalist writers thought, thought it might be. You know, in other words, he hope he thinks that things. Uh, collapse, but automatically, once they revert to the way, they will immediately revert to the way they should be once things collapse. In other words, there's not going to be some slow march to a golden age after a collapse. He thinks it will automatically happen. So Crowley, to a certain extent, actively uh, promotes a lot of things that might um, case in the collapse, whereas uh, um, most traditionalists seek to slow the process, uh, he is willing to actively push it along because he thinks things will immediately, the, flip, the switch will immediately flip and the lights will come on and the Kali Yuga will brighten the world, as it were, not destroy it. So, uh, in other words, he is he sees a use for the mass man in the future. He does not totally denigrate them and think that they have no future value or uh, purpose. What are your thoughts on uh, Crowley's views about his sexuality? I know he wrote this uh, book of poems called A White Strains, and it basically deals with uh, every kind of a subset of uh, human sexuality. Like there's a well, there's a lot of a say like sadomasochism. Uh, homoeroticism, just pretty much anything you can think of. Especially a theme, uh, like, uh, there's like a theme of like a power, but some of them are also like a romantic uh, love poems as well. Well, again, going back to Crowley was not into uh, LARPing, as it were. He practiced all this stuff. And I see it under the same vein as his mountain climbing in that uh, it, uh, it was active practice, a certain, uh, the sexual practices impacted his spiritual outlook and impacted the way he saw things and understood things, and that's what their purpose was in the long run, in impacting one's understanding of uh, both spirit, matter, uh, and uh, and uh, gaining wisdom through the various uh, both sexual magic rituals and actively engaging in uh, in commonplace uh, uh, interactions of that sort. I don't understand a lot of those pur purposes, but I don't understand a lot of. Uh, Freemasonic rituals and purposes, but the fact that we don't understand them, that we are not initiates of them, does not 
um, I, all I can say is I don't understand them, but I know it has some purpose, though I'm not an initiate. Because if it didn't have some purpose, they would not be practiced to this day. The Bohe- Bohemian Grove we know is real, and their sexual practices are not just done for their own amusement. They ha- they have a valid basis. I don't understand that basis, but I understand that to them it is not a matter of just pure pleasure. It to them they believe it has a valid basis and purpose. And that, likewise, likewise with Crowley. That reminds me of what uh, James O'Meara said in our interview in regards to homosexuality: is that both the left and the right look at homosexuality from a a moralistic ground. One side, well, the right says homosexuality is immoral. The left says that uh, homophobia is immoral, that it's a moral imperative to uh, tolerate homosexuality. But uh, James's point was that you should look at things as like, what is the role that this group and behavior has in society? rather than looking at things from a a purely uh, moralistic reaction? Well, uh, I view most forms of sexual excess as paraphilias. And I view paraphilias as rather like I do drug use. Drug use has many purposes, and the more intelligent people use drugs for various reasons, and paraphilias are used like drugs, essentially sex. They say sex and drugs. I say sex and drugs. For I I put those two for different reasons together in that they can be used for experience. In other words, you experience drugs or you're just addicted to them. You just like the feel of them or you're addicted to them or you like the experience or what you gain from each experience that uh, does something for you or your intellectual state. And and uh, this is why, you know, Crowley experimented widely with drugs. I think it was the same principle in that he was furthering his intellectual state as well as just treating it as a vice. It was more for, than a vice. Well, that's... For the four, basically, the thing is, a lot of this stuff, there's like the, the small group of people you're talking about, but for, say, the kind of like the conformist masses, like... Those people, do you think they're better off under a more, like, stricter conservative morality? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Crowley never generalized his religion. Thelema, his religion, Crowley was not much of uh, of a a religionist in terms that he treated his disciples badly. He did not proselytize extensively. And what I think his basic view is, is that this kind of, of thing is not for everyone. Just as mountaineering is not for everyone, it's for a select few. The rest of the people have to do what's best for them. And their own experience with freedom has to be, in, has to be within certain boundaries because most people don't want to push boundaries. So most people want to experience freedom in their own limited boundaries. And to push them outside of those boundaries, as we do in this society, the media, the mass media, and other people pushes people way out of their comfort zones to do all kinds of depraved sexual acts and things that go against their normal natures. Now, some people, to some people, that's not depravity. To, to an intellectual, to myself, I don't consider a lot of actions depraved that I don't engage in. But yet, there are a lot of people who naturally feel they're depraved, but engage in them because the mass media tells them to. So the mass media essentially forces people to engage in depraved actions against their will, and it makes them uncomfortable, it makes them depressed, it damages them severely. Do, and do that's they, do they them, engage that, in that's these... pushing them against their will, against their freedom. Do they engage in these activities... Because they feel that they have a moral obligation to engage in these activities, like if, if somebody um, who is not a homosexual um, wants to show that they are tolerant, so they engage in oral sex with another man, um, they, they may do that out of a moral I don't see obligation. That as an example necessarily, but um, let's just take uh, oral sex in general. It was never a heterosexual pastime. It, be, it was always a, a homosexual pastime that eventually 
uh, became adopted by heterosexuals. And so the, the common nature of uh, uh, the commonness of, uh, of uh, oral sex in, in this society among heterosexuals, it's unnatural for heterosexuals and heterosexuals feel well, vaguely uncomfortable with it. Yeah, that was even the case in ancient Rome. Uh, Philadelphia was sort of practiced in a homosexual stance where one, but with one man and another man, but it was sort of, it was considered very dirty for uh, heterosexuals to engage in Philadelphia or kind of like a... Yeah, it was considered very abnormal. And to this day, I think a woman feels uh, essentially depraved, but at the same time, she feels compelled by society to engage in it. So it, it affects every woman that engages in it fundamentally, I think. Now, there are a select few women always who will engage in any depraved act and be perfectly comfortable with it. But the vast majority are forced into it by the mass media and by common perceptions. So, against, so they're going against their freedom. They're being pushed out of the boundaries that they themselves, their minds naturally well, I mean, I, I also I also think there is a, a an idea of like dominance within within sexuality, though. I mean, but but yeah, so, but as far as so taboos go, yeah. But as far as taboos go, I, I think things fluctuate through the years. Like, what is it, what is the acceptable form of domination, and, and what is the unacceptable form? Well, absolutely, I don't disagree with that. But uh, I'm just saying that Crowley say. Crowley's thought is that uh, the individual should have freedom to exist within their own boundaries. And it, not everybody wants to be cr like Crowley has pushed the boundaries all the time. He also advocated uh, kind of like youth colonies for uh, children who wanted to uh, leave their parents. What's interesting about that is that's something that's always been kind of practiced uh, by the elites, but it's not something that's practiced so much by the masses. You could even make uh, comparisons to like uh, Hitler Youth or the left. There's like that leftist uh, youth camp that was attacked by Anders Breivik. But it's very important to power because if you want to have power in society, you need to have control of the youth. And that's if you sort of have these like a uh, generational divides, which we see in our society, that puts the youth of the masses in control of the elite. And while you, if you have like a youth camp that provides a, an opposition uh, to the power structure, and Crowley was very kind of ingrained with the elite, and he understand uh, how they thought. Well, it, it, again, you're not even focusing on gen on general youth. You're focusing on that top ten percent that is always going to be placed in the camps and indoctrinated for future use by the leadership of any country or any power structure. And that's why in every high school in the country you have a valedictorian, you have a salutatorian, and you have a top 5% of the class that is carefully monitored, uh, carefully managed, and carefully steered into various programs to enable them to be leaders of the community, but they are groomed for this position they are they are groomed by older people sexually, socially, and so forth and so on to be to fulfill um, these uh, future leadership roles, but also to accept the influence of older leaders throughout their lifetime. So, in other so words, the opposite of like the hippie mantra: "Don't trust anyone over 30. Yeah, exactly. But uh, again, the, the the hippies were not well, the hippies were on the early end of this because it was prior to it, after World War uh, Two that this became ingrained in the United States as uh, the power structure began to actively engage in the in the Greek type of mentoring in, in which they uh, expected every the the younger people to carefully. Uh, be controlled by the older generations. And uh, it was a form of sexual, social, moral uh, control in which uh, the older individuals dominated the younger and still do to this day. 
So you will have people like Henry Kissinger that are still relevant to this day. And you'll have a vast number of individuals under them who still listen with rapt attention to whatever they say because they're under their sway, regardless of the fact that Henry Kissinger hasn't had an original thought since 1976. He still is a power, and there are many other elderly people who hold the real power in the world today because they started with youthful acolytes and controlled them so thoroughly. When we interviewed a James O'Meara, uh, Alex, do you remember what he kind of said about that topic? About what how the boys the, thought? the elites want to break down kind of the bonds. Uh, they we, want to break down like male bonding, but they also want to kind of separate uh, the, the, age groups. Well, and yeah, they well, yeah, sexual yeah. Sexual stigmas to kind of stigmatize that. Well, what what O'Meara was saying was that, uh, you know, in the 1930s, it was like, You'd have the gang of boys, you know, like the, the little rascals is an example that, you know, would go and hang out and they would have a man who was sort of the Cub Scout, perhaps the Cub Scout master or the, uh, the, the Catholic priest, the Catholic priest who was the, uh, you know, the kind of like grandfather to the group of kids, the group of boys. And um, now when, when we think of the Cub Scout master or we think of the Catholic priest, uh, I think most people think of pedophiles. I think they think of pedophiles when they think of those two archetypes of men. Now, it's funny because uh, uh, I, I forgot. I think I was talking to some some normie about this recently. He said that uh, he he was dismayed that Catholics Catholic priests got a bad rap because because teachers have sex with their students much much more than Catholic priests molest. But we have to say that the that the uh, the teacher is good because the teacher is part of the state apparatus, and we can't vilify them as a molester. We have to vilify the uh, the Catholic uh, priest as the uh, well, as a molester. Rob, was that on our show? I think I think so. But there's also there was some I forget the name of it. So but it there was some Norman film about like a British boarding school. Okay, and it shows like the older the older boys having like a dominant homosexual relationship in a like, hierarchical power sense. That's, and that's that went on that for, piece, for over yeah. 100 years, uh, over 200 years with British boarding schools, and it was just commonly ingrained that you had the older, older more stronger boys, and you had their servants that they call fags, um, who the younger, weaker boys that served them. And that was a self-perpetuating system. Uh, Winston uh, Churchill Jr., uh, I believe, wrote or Winston Churchill II, uh, Winston Churchill's son, wrote extensively about the system, and uh, I think he, uh, he actually underwent it. So it was a self-perpetuating system. What I was going to add to uh, Omer's comments is that Steve Saylor has noted that in the case of the Catholic priests, many of those... Uh, accused of molesting the children or the boys uh, actually played a passive role in the sex acts. That it so, was, inst it was instigated... Passive, yeah. Not meaning to be crude, but you mean a passive role? You mean like, uh, say, giving, f performing philodio rather than forcing... Yeah, philodio. exactly. Exactly. And so that... that That's actually point. different in, like, say, ancient uh, pederasty in ancient Greece. It would have been the other way around. Exactly. Well, it, well, you know what's what's kind of funny is that that Milo Yiannopoulos has said uh, multiple times that uh, that he forced a, a priest to have sex with him. What? <laughs> yeah, that he like yeah something something like that he was molested by a priest, but that he was the one doing the molesting. Now, while you know, well, I sort of like threw that to the side because I just think he's a provocateur, and I kind of don't believe a lot of things he so says. There's, a, but. there's always going to be that precocious 5% that are like Milo, who did basically get to where he is on his knees um, all along the line. I mean, Milo just come out of nowhere, and he didn't just come out of nowhere, it's just because you didn't see him, because he was on his knees all the way up. Well, the and, thing about um, that psychology is, like, forcing... Uh, for a forcing uh, act is like an act of dominance. Uh, so let's say you had a uh, a priest who was to perform philodio. That's more that I don't know if there's what their psychology is. I guess it's just 
like uh, act of like physical attraction, but there isn't that strong element of a dominance that you would see in like traditional uh, pederasty. Well, again, we're looking at most of the victims or so-called victims were virile uh, boys in their middle teens who had very little sexual outlets. And so the te- I think you, you could say that the priests who were passive homosexuals themselves were attracted to the boys' masculinity and were, you know, desired to play the passive role in, in their interactions. So again, uh, that, and uh, speaking uh, on, the, on this whole subject is that uh, Crowley himself often played the passive role um, in his uh, same-sex relationships. Well, yeah, he was interested and he received, uh, well, he, he played the passive role in a homosexual sodomy, but he was also interested in a, a sadomasochism with the uh, dominate, women who were dominatrix. Yeah, there was, um, I, I would say, uh, Crowley was very much of a switch, and there aren't very many switches. Uh, I think of, uh, oh, uh, uh, Max Mosley, the uh, the son of Sir Oswald Mosley, and uh, I can't think of the the prominent uh, Lady Diana Mosley, I think her name was. She was from one of the very, uh, uh, she was one of several sisters that embraced fascism. But uh, I can't think of the, the Mitfords, I think it was. But uh, Max Mosley was a few years ago... Uh, shown to be a switch in that he enjoyed both dominating and being dominated by women. And, uh, it was, it, you know, it came out as a, um, as a big, uh, as a big, uh, scandal two years ago. He was chairman of some prominent British corporation. And, uh, so it is fundamentally an Anglo trait, I think, but it's uncommon to find a switch. I think anyone will tell you, Usually, an individual is one or the other, a dominant or a submissive, and uh, very few people are true switches. Alex, you want to comment? (laughs) Uh, Wow. Well, uh, that's a pretty interesting idea. I'm sort of, I'm like uh, (laughs) unpacking that, unpacking that in my head a bit. So, so what is what is it about about Anglo? So sexuality that that separates it from uh, you know the sexuality of other Europeans, you know, because I always take it, I don't know, a, but you, this you is idea of Anglo predominantly in Anglo sexuality. Sadomasochism is predominant in Anglo sexuality. It always has been. There's always been an obsession with dominance, whether it be in the same sex or or uh, or uh, heterosexual relationships. You will find it. Um, well, could, you know, could that be related aspect. to? Could that and be related I think to... it might be because of the British class system. Yeah, yeah. Or it might just be inherent in the Anglo character. But there's a sense of order. To, it goes back to you know the uh, 16th and 17th century pornography. You know, you won't find that in Italian uh, in Italian pornography or uh, or uh, French pornography or the story of Casanova. It's entirely different. It's it's uniquely uh, Anglo. It's not European or continental. Would you say that a Crowley was like the original uh, troll? Like we have this whole like troll phenomenon now. Like examples like my. I think I think troll, Crowley was uh, one of the very early trolls. Yes, um, of the twenty first twentieth century, and I think trolling is a is a rational response to modernism. And Crowley, and Crowley was one of the first people to confront modern, modern, modernism with trolling. In other words, he was the first to, person, one of the first to devise the method of trolling to confront modernism. Well, wasn't the Boston Tea Party a form of trolling in a way? I think the Boston Tea Party was a viable form of terrorism. <laughs> because what you had, the, the counterpart to that today would be if a bunch of guys dressed up like uh, Muslim terrorists and uh, went and went to like a chicken factory and uh, dumped all the chicken out to rot or freed all the chickens in a uh, 
in a uh, chicken factory that were about to be butchered. That would be uh, analogous to uh, the Boston Tea Party. If uh, Crowley were alive uh, today, uh, what do you think would be some of his observations on today's society and his thoughts on these different political uh, movements? I think Crowley would be entirely disinterested in Western politics. I think Crowley would be focused. He would go. To, he would interact with the cartels. He would be fascinated by the new narco religions, and uh, it would be. Uh, it would, he would have very little to do with uh, Western power structures as they are. He would, I think he would be more interested in uh, forms of European uh, culture uh, entering in the third world or emerging in the third world. For example, in South America, the power structures are still very much white-dominated, but by a different kind of white uh, than, uh, or European people of European ancestry than we're used to seeing. In other words, you have like Mexico, it's a bunch of tall white guys running the country and, uh, or the cartels, a bunch of tall white guys running the cartels, uh, or blonde haired, blue eyed guys. So I think, and the same with China in that the, um, and various other Asian countries in that the tallest and fairest off or with some Aryan lineage, end up ruling. So he would be looking for those power structures in the third world or in the Asian world that were still of European descent and studying them and focusing on them rather than focusing on the dying European accepted politics, party politics and religions and, and so on, because there's just not much interesting going on in Western society right now. Well, um, you know, s some would say that these kind of uh, uh, this sort of rejection of, of globalism that's happening throughout the Western world might be an interesting thing. What do you think uh, Crowley would say about that, or just would he just dismiss it entirely? I think uh, I don't think, like I said, I don't think Crowley would pay any attention to anything that was commonplace unless he could somehow profit by it. Um, he would into totally ignore the uh, what well, the accepted uh, because when we realize everything put out in the Western world that we talk about is media smoke and mirrors. You have to look for the essentials that actually matter, not what the media po posits or places forward for us to believe are the essentials. What are a the actual essentials, not the not those things that labor under the guise of important matters. So he would be focusing on what's actually important in this world today, which uh, really very little have to do with the Western the Western Hemisphere. There's a lot going on again in South America and Mexico with the cartels. It dominates the narco-religions. In uh, Asia, there's the resurgence of fascism. Uh, a lot of stuff going on with Islam and... Uh, Islam is literally falling apart right now. Islam is literally disintegrating before our eyes, and we think we are, we, the Western world fears Islam, and it's literally disintegrating right now in, before our very eyes. So, uh, can you, can you go would be ignoring the, con the contemporary understanding of things and actually looking at having experiences that would help him understand things directly. Are there any uh, modern. Uh, thinkers today who you see uh, parallels with Crowley? You know, the problem with uh, modern thinkers, and honestly, I know there are a few, but none come to mind just off the top of my head. Uh, the problem with modern thinkers is that they don't seek to have experiences like Crowley. Most people are, uh, this goes back to most people are men that are. are just who are interested in writing and thinking and committing their thoughts to paper, but they're not interested in actually having experiences or going, traveling or mountaineering or doing things to prove their, their theories. Very few people in our societies are interested in proving their theories on any subject or putting their theories to the test. 
So Crowley, like I said, Crowley would be all over the place. I don't see anybody acting like Crowley. Um, at least uh, uh, no one that is, you know, actually going public. There are what people who people are doing it. on the fringes, like people you know? Yeah, I, I do know individuals like Crowley, but um, they're not widely known or, or, uh, or uh, you know, or, you know, nor do they want to be known because the world, uh, the world is considerably more, uh, that world is considerably more dangerous these days than it was in Crowley's days. Uh, because uh, a lot of these movements take their privacy a lot more seriously in this day and age, despite the fact that uh, they have no regard for the privacy of others, uh, nor do they really care if their movement is exposed to the general public because uh, the general public is incapable of doing anything about it. Paul, we're getting close to the end of the show. I think for our next show, I would like to talk about Italian futurism. But before I wrap things up, uh, can you kind of give a sort of introduction to our next show on how they relate to Crowley? Uh, Crowley was very influential on the Italian scene because Again, everything new comes from the old, and Crowley was very interested in this, as were a number of Italians in the early 20th century as futurism came to the front. And futurism was uh, led by individuals such as Marinetti and D'Annunzio, who were also very interested in tradition, right, and Freemasonry. And uh, they coexisted in this period in Italy, and they had a great deal to do with one another because a lot of them were physical types who were very interested in actively proving their theories again and very um, very interested in seeing the end of both modernism and democracy. They were they were they were embracing certain aspects of modernism, rejecting most aspects of modernism that are currently uh, embraced by Western society. They also totally reject liberalism. So Crowley has certain I interests that are very similar to futurist, to the futurist movement. But at the same time, in that period of the 20th century, early 20th century, there were a number of movements that uh, existed. We might put them in the same tent would today. You, would you put like, um, were... uh, like, how would like, uh, what is it, vor vorticism, like uh, fa fascist modernism, Wyndham Lewis? That kind of stuff. Well, vorticism, see, that's, that's exactly where I'm going, because Wyndham Lewis hated Marinetti and the Futurists and actively heckled them personally. Um, his vorticist movement actually actively heckled those, uh, the Futurists in, 20, in, in the 1920s. So could we, so they, I guess we'll talk about this a bit on the next show as well. We'll talk about Wyndham Lewis and vorticism. Okay, so my, with my point is, all, all, you can put all these people in the same tent today, but they felt like they were fiercely independent of one another each, um, at that time. Crowley, Wyndham Lewis, Marinetti, and the Futurists, they all, they all seem to have very similar views today, but at that time, they felt that they were very differing, very different in their appraisal of, uh, of uh, the, the big picture, as it were. So that would be my closing remarks on that subject, and we'll, I guess we'll delve into that more in that future show. Paul Bingham, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Robert. And also, uh, thanks, Alex. It's been a great talk, guys, and I look forward to uh, talking to you about futurism.